Okay, hello everyone. My name is Jennifer Wilson. I'm the executive director of Cassie and Friends Society, and I'm really excited to welcome you all here tonight for JIA 101. Before we get started, I just wanted to take a brief second to introduce our organization. For those of you who aren't familiar with Cassie and Friends, we are the only organization in Canada 100% focused on transforming the lives of kids and families affected by juvenile arthritis and other rheumatic diseases. We're largely led by youth and parents themselves, and a really special part of Cassie and Friends is the way we bring them together with their pediatric rheumatology healthcare teams and researchers in Canada to work on our vision. And our vision that we're working hard on every day is a pain-free future for kids. Now, we know research is a huge part of that puzzle, and that is a big piece of our charity and the fundraising and mission that we have. But we also know from working with thousands of kids and families across Canada every day that support, connection, and education are a vital piece of their journey with rheumatic disease and to living their healthiest and best lives possible. And that's why we are so excited to be launching today our brand new Cassie and Friends virtual education series. Now, our series would not be possible without our sponsors. So I just wanted to take a brief moment to thank our presenting sponsors, Nicola Wealth Management, Avvi, Amgen, Roche, and Sobe. Today, you'll notice that raising awareness of juvenile arthritis is also a big part of what we do. All day long, we've been seeing posts from Team Cassie and Friends, which is our virtual run walk that has been going on across Canada. And if you have any insights or want to share what you're learning today with, with your network of friends and families across social media, please do take the time to tag Cassie and Friends, whether that be Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. Now, a really, really exciting part about this session and something so important to Cassie and Friends is the chance for you to ask your questions directly to our expert speakers. So if you have a question during the session, um, if you look down at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see a Q&A button. And if you click that, you can actually enter your questions directly into the screen. We might not have time to answer every question tonight, so if we don't get to your question, you can always follow up afterwards to info at cassiumfriends.ca or visit our website where we have a ton of resources that might help you with your question and or you can find another way to contact us. So without further delay, I'm really excited to uh, introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker tonight is Jen O'Shea. Jen and her family live north of London um, and uh, her little daughter, Lily, who's just a beautiful little girl, uh, has been living with polyarticular arthritis since February 2016. Jen and Lily also happen to be a patient of our medical speaker tonight, Dr. Bobby Berard. And without further ado, I'll hand it over to Jen to share her story of Lily's arthritis. Hello, everyone. Um, hopefully you can hear me okay. I just want to say thanks for joining and listening in tonight. And I hope that by um, listening to my family's story, we can provide you with some insight and maybe some hope with your journey with JIA. So Lily was diagnosed with JIA uh, in February of 2016, and she was actually only 26 months old at the time. Uh, a lot of times we often get asked, even still to this day, when people find out she has arthritis, how did we know or what were those first signs? And for us, it kind of felt like it started all of a sudden. Um, most, uh, most of the, it probably didn't actually. Uh, however, what we did notice was it was actually Christmas day in 2015 and we took her out of her crib and she couldn't walk. So she was really stiff and she was crying. And basically what happened over the next six weeks is we discovered that stiffness just got worse. It was really bad in the mornings and in the afternoons after her naps and at nighttime. So of course what we did was we made appointments with our GP. We um, had x-rays done, we had massages, we had we went to the chiropractor. And after an x-ray showed up with nothing on it, our GP then referred us to pediatric ortho at um, LHSC. 
So in a couple of weeks, we were in ortho. Um, but as soon as we were there, the ortho doctor took one look at her and she said, it's, this isn't me, it's uh, inflammation. So from there on, we were referred to pediatric rheumatology and that's where we uh, met Dr. Burrard. So slide two, please. Um, so yes, Lily was uh, diagnosed by Dr. Burrard and her team on uh, February of 2016. Uh, it definitely was an emotional day, I'm sure. Um, but due to, uh, she had so many joints inflamed when she was first diagnosed that immediately Dr. Burrard thought that cortisone injections were needed for Lil so that she wouldn't be in so much pain. We also decided that day when we were there that she was going to go on methotrexate and um, Dr. Brad and her nurses uh, asked us if we wanted to give it to her via injection or if we wanted to give it to her orally. And we did decide to do an injection because they said that works faster um, and that was important to us. So even still to this day, Lily still does get an injection of methotrexate. Um, and on the pictures here, it says uh, injection. So there is a picture there of her coming home from her first round of injections. And it, it made a huge difference for her, even as little as she was, the next morning she woke up and she could stand up and get out of her own bed. So she noticed that the pain was not as much. Slide three, please. And then over the next, three to four months, we had numerous appointments back and forth with Dr. Burrard back into London, trying to figure everything out essentially in all of her joints that were affected because there was a lot. It was her ankles, um, her knees, her hips, her wrists, some finger joints, um, some tendons in her feet, um, a lot more than we had initially thought. Um, and due to the foot issues, we actually ended up having a second round in June, only a couple months after the first. So there she is there getting her injection or before her injections. Slide four. So over the next two years of Lil's life, we would have many appointments with Dr. Burrard. Usually about every 12 weeks we'd go in to see and that was for routine checkups and also the blood work because she was on methotrexate. We even uh, had an MRI in there and as time carried on, Lily's body reacted very positively to her methotrexate and after about two years, I think if my timing's right, she was essentially weaning herself naturally off of the methotrexate because she was growing, but her dosage, we weren't increasing it due to her body weight. So it was getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, so the summer of 2018, when we had our appointment, we were, it was great. Dr. Barrett said she's doing well, there's no signs of inflammation anywhere. And hopefully, you know, in the next four months, there's a possibility that we could take her off of the medication. Great news. So in the meantime, uh, slide five, please. Uh, Lily, she went to school, no problem. Um, sports, soccer, hockey, dance, you name it, she's tried it. Um, she helps out on her farm, loves it. It def JIA does not define Lil by any means. Um, and she loves this, all these things with all of her might. You can see a big smile on her face all the time. Slide six, please. But I guess the trick is, is that with JIA, we never, I guess I've learned that we're never really completely out of the woods. We're going to have some hiccups along the way. So after having a good report in the summer, uh, November of that year came around, so Lily was five, and she was playing hockey, and she was complaining of her feet hurting, but she only ever complained when she skated, so we just kind of wiped it off and didn't really think of anything of it. Nothing else in her body hurt, just her feet. However, when we saw Dr. Brard in the new year, um, we were hit with some bad news. Um, 
we had realized that she had flared. So she once again had inflammation in her, specifically in her feet, her ankles and her wrists. Um, so her body essentially didn't really like being off of the medication. So instead of what we thought we were going to be doing is losing the medication altogether, what we had to do was we had to amp up. So disappointing um, for all of us, really. I know it was a disappointing day, but of course we knew that this had to be done. Um, just like uh, actually just this year, the, Lily's wrist was still sort of an issue. Um, not that she was complaining about pain, just that Dr. Bird was still feeling um, something in there. So she ended up having a cortisone injection wide awake at that. And then just in June, she had an MRI just to double check. The MRI came back clean. There was no inflammation. So she, her wrist, she's good to go. And as you can see by the pictures, regardless of what procedure she goes through, she's a pretty happy cat. So uh, slide seven, please. Um, so the next time we see Dr. Burrard is for a visit in December. So we're crossing our fingers for a good outcome. Um, and we never know what it's going to be, but what we do know is that we always have support from our family and friends and uh, a fabulous medical team who answers our questions whenever we need them to. And I know Lily is in great hands. Slide eight. So for all of you families out there with a new diagnosis, um, the road can seem long, but you just have to know that there is light at the end of the tunnel and when you get to that point, you can look back and you can see how far you've come because that's what we've done and we're very grateful. Thank you for listening. Thank you. I think my video is back on. I just want to thank you so much, Jen, for sharing your story with us. And I know that um, what stood out for me was that GIA does not define Lily. And we have an amazing community at Cassie and Friends that really is just all about the fact that you are not alone. Your children are not alone. That we have an amazing community here and it's a community of kids playing sports, dancing, playing soccer, achieving their dreams. Um, and they might have some extra challenges along the way, but uh, with the, uh, the community around you and excellent medical care, um, we know that um, this journey can not only, um, you know, get through this journey, but also just enrich your lives and, and make you stronger in so many ways. Um, I'm sure there are listeners are going to have some questions for Jennifer. So I, I just want to reiterate that there's a Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom screen. And at any time during this um, program, you can put your question in. Um, but we will do uh, the live Q&A at the end where Jen will come back. So thank you again so much, Jen. And we can go to the next slide. So with that, I am really excited to present uh, and introduce our, our medical speaker today, our expert speaker, Dr. Bobby Berard. Bobby is the Chief of Pediatric Rheumatology at the Children's Hospital in London, Ontario at the London Health Sciences Centre. Um, she's also an Associate Professor of Pediatrics and an incredibly valued member of our own Cassie and Friends Medical Advisory Committee. Um, Bobby has been instrumental in providing our community with um, cutting edge and sort of up to date every moment uh, information during uh, the pandemic that's going on. So Cassie and Friends, if you go to our website, you will see uh, a COVID-19 banner um, and you can go there to uh, access guidance directly from our medical advisory committee, as well as ask questions specifically relating to COVID on that site. Um, today though, Bobby is going to give us an overview of juvenile idiopathic arthritis, as well as share uh, some of the latest research on outcomes and treatments. So um, I'm very pleased to welcome Bobby. Hello. Um, 
And uh, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. I trust that uh, you guys can hear me. Um, so uh, thank you very much. And Jen, that was beautiful. Uh, thank you very much for that lovely presentation about Lily. You did a great job. So today we are going to uh, go over an uh, introduction to JIA 101, as we call it. And uh, next slide, please. So just to kind of warm us up here, when, we, when, when we're talking about arthritis, what we mean by that is either a joint that is swollen or has liquid in it, water, you can think of it, or liquid, or it is the joint that has loss of its normal movement pattern, uh, pain with movement, warmth, and tenderness on movement. Um, and in this picture, uh, you can see the right knee has some swelling uh, localized in the upper part above the kneecap, sort of in the knee, that's the most obvious part. Um, so when we are saying the word arthritis, that's what we mean. We either, it, it's either swollen or it has a painful loss of its normal movement. And that can be caused by number, numerous things, including infection, medication reactions, vir there's many, many things that can cause arthritis, but specifically, next slide, when we're talking about uh, juvenile idiopathic arthritis, um, this is a terminology that we've used now for the last 25 years or so. And what the term JIA means is that J for juvenile. So that means that the child has to have onset of their symptoms before their 16th birthday. Idiopathic means it's of an unknown cause. And the truth is we're making so much progress in understanding um, the factors in, in our genes and the environment and why kids are getting arthritis. But, but it's, it, it also just signifies that it means that it's not from one of these other things like a medication reaction, infection, cancer, other causes. So idiopathic. Um, and then arthritis, meaning the joint swelling and or, and or painful loss of movement. And the arthritis has to last for at least six weeks, generally speaking, so that we can rule out some of the other causes of a swollen joint. And very importantly, um, there's no single blood test or imaging that we can do that can give us, say, slam dunk 100%, you have arthritis. It's really by talking with our patients and their families, um, learning about their changes in function and, and hearing, hearing their story, um, and then the physical examination. So it's putting that together um, with ruling out other causes. That's how we come to our diagnosis of juvenile arthritis. Um, next slide, please. So as you begin your journey of juvenile arthritis, often your rheumatologist will talk about a, the different subtypes of JIA. And um, here you will see this, this table, and I will talk a little bit about each one of these in turn, but there are uh, seven subtypes of, of JIA. And you can see the frequency with which they occur in any given clinic population. So if you take 100 children, for example, the most common subtype that we would see is oligoarthritis, and that you would see in about a third of kids. And that means that they have ranging from one to four joints, they're often toddlers, and that one is much more, that subtype is much more common in girls. Then second to that, we see polyarthritis, and that means five or more joints are, are affected uh, in the first sort of six, six months. Uh, and basically, uh, important point to note is polyarthritis is about 15 to 25 percent of kids, so up to one in four, um, and it can present in the toddler range or in the school age range, kind of throughout the childhood period. Um, but from you, importantly, you will see that only about 5% of kids have rheumatoid factor being positive. And a lot of people, um, particularly in adult world, hang on this rheumatoid factor test or the blood test. And you will see in pediatrics, it's actually quite uncommon for our children to have that rheumatoid factor being positive. So some of the other subtypes are about 10 to 15%, including systemic, enthesitis-related arthritis, psoriatic, and undifferentiated. And I'll just show you some pictures and talk a little bit more about each of those. Um, but by far, sort of the most common subtypes we see would be oligoarthritis and, and polyarthritis. Next slide, please. So these are just a few more pictures of, of swollen joints that we might see in our clinic. So on the left-hand side, you see the left knee is quite swollen. Similarly, the picture on the right, this is a swelling in the back of the knee. Sometimes when the knee is largely swollen, it actually pushes out um, into the back into a, 
a potential sac that lives there that can get filled up with fluid. Um, and as you know from your own children that kids are so incredibly resilient and they don't they often don't complain of these of these swellings that you would think that would us as adults this would have us grumbling quite a lot so uh, next slide please um, here again on the left this would be looking at a swollen a swollen the left picture but also the left ankle looking from behind you can't see the the ankle bones as well defined and on the right hand side, this would be a, a large swelling kind of of the wrist that you can see there and even of the knuckles of the left hand. So these are some of the findings that we're looking for on examination that, you know, patients and families themselves certainly may not notice or may not appreciate because kids are so incredibly resilient in how they manage and adapt to what they're what they're doing. It's, it's you know, that's why our examination and seeing patients regularly is so very important. Uh, next slide, please. So, as I mentioned, oligoarthritis is uh, one to four joints in the first six months of disease. And with oligoarthritis, we talk about two different courses or paths that the disease can follow. So one is persistent, and that would be a child that throughout their experience with arthritis, they only have one to four joints affected. This group is unique in that they are the oligoarthritis patients have about one in five children that can be affected by uveitis. And uveitis is inflammation of the eye. Um, and I will come back to that, but that actually can be a significant um, issue for patients in terms of need, need for medications and treatments. And, and, it, and although there may be a lesser number of joints affected, uveitis can be very important for um, patients and families. Next slide, please. So when we're talking about the other disease paths that oligoarthritis can, find, can follow, there's something called oligoarthritis extended. And that means that, you know, as we're first meeting um, a child in the first six months, they have one to four joints. But after the six month time period in the years that we're following kids, they can go on to develop more than five joints that are affected. And if we sort of look the median time or the most you know, doc frequent time that it could be is somewhere in the range of two to four years after the time of diagnosis, often closer to the four year mark. So it often obviously comes as quite a shock to families where they've been dealing with an oligoarthritis or one, two, three, four joints that can fluctuate, but then over time or there's development of more. So that often will change how, how kids are treated. And so that happens in about a third of, or 20 to 30% of kids that they go on to have more joints affected over time. Next slide, please. So polyarthritis, as I mentioned, is in the first six months that we're, we're meeting um, a child in their family, they have more than five joints affected. And as I sort of touched on is um, only about three to 5% will have the rheumatoid factor or the RA blood test be positive that, you know, many adults and um, have that factor positive. And in, in reading about arthritis, not specific to kids, a lot of people will think there's a, a blood test that can sort of tell us about arthritis, but blood test is actually uncom very uncommon to be positive in our patients. Next slide, please. So there's another subtype of JIA that is very, very different from the other subtypes. Um, it looks different. We treat it differently um, for the most part. Um, it's systemic arthritis. So these, these children, we often actually meet in the hospital because they come in with high spiking fevers and they often have rashes and a, a lot of inflammation in the blood when we take their blood, their blood samples. Um, and they can have arthritis or severe joint pain. And so they're, usually we meet them uh, in the hospital because these kids are very, very sick. So it looks very different from the other types of, of juvenile arthritis. Um, I should also just note this sometimes comes up, but kids don't switch between categories per se, unless they go from oligoarthritis persistent to extended. They don't, it's not like, they don't generally, they, well, they don't switch from category to category. So, okay, next slide. Uh, psoriatic arthritis, uh, patients with psoriatic arthritis can have few joints involved, so under four, or they can have over five, have a polyarthritis picture. But some of the other findings that we look for that helps us sort of 
place a child into the psoriatic arthritis subtype would be um, on the far left, you'll see a swollen, uh, the third finger particularly is, is swollen diffusely. So that is something called dactylitis. But what dactylitis means is swelling of joints and tendons. So that third finger, there's a, the knuckle joint, the middle knuckle joint and a far knuckle joint by the nail. And then you can see that the swelling is sort of more than just the joint. The whole finger looks like what we, the, another term we use for this would be a sausage digit. So this, this is something we see more commonly in patients that have psoriatic arthritis subtype. We also can see nail pits, which is the middle picture here. So um, sometimes, you know, we are looking trying to find the right light angle in our clinics looking for pits because sometimes it's just one or two pits on a couple of nails that we're looking for. These are adult fingers which have a lot more pitting often. And then the third, this is obviously an adult uh, foot, but we can see this thickened um, thicken nail twindings. Patients with psoriatic arthritis also uh, may have a first degree relative, so a sibling or a parent that has uh, psoriasis. And that's part of how we help to um, place a child into that category as well. Next slide, please. So emphysitis related arthritis is again affects about 10 to 15, some, sometimes 20% depending on the clinic population that you're um, looking at of patients. This is the one subtype that is more common in boys. It tends to present in the teenage or early teen years and it involves often the large joints of the lower extremities, so hips, knees, and ankles, but can also have involvement of uh, the joints of the low back, which is the middle figure, fig, fig, middle picture here, sorry. So you can see um, there is a joint that joins our tailbone, I don't think you can see my pointer, but our, our tailbone to our hip bones. And, and these arrows are pointing to joints called the sacroiliac joints. So our hip bone up, on the sides is the sac or sorry is the ilium and the middle our tailbone is the sacrum and it's the joint in between those two bones and that can become inflamed as well furthermore um, kids with endocytis related arthritis can get inflammation of where tendons attach to bones and that's what endocytis means it's the inflammation of where a tendon attaches to bone so the upper left figure would be where your achilles tendon attaches to your heel bone and it's just showing a little bite mark out of that heel bone where there's been inflammation and irritation there it's caused a bit, a bit the inflammation has caused a bit of a bite mark out of that now the bottom right picture is is the arrow should be on the on the right ankle but it does show a swollen ankle so you can't see the achilles very well or the Achilles could be swollen itself, but also the heel looks beefy and red and swollen. And so we can see inflammation where that Achilles attaches to the bone. And that's the enthesitis part, which um, is, can be very, very painful. And it, it can be challenging to treat for kids. And it, it, and it, it does significantly impact sometimes their, their pain levels and their quality of life because enthesitis is, is particularly painful uh, for some patients. So next slide. So just a bit more about uveitis. So as I mentioned, uveitis is inflammation in the eye. And this can happen in up to about 20% of patients with JIA. It's more common if one a certain blood test called ANA is positive. So ANA is a blood test that we will frequently do in our clinics. It is not, um, it does not help us make a diagnosis of arthritis. However, when it is positive in a patient that has arthritis, it it indicates to us that the risk of getting inflammation in the eye is higher. We also see more uveitis in younger patients, female patients, and sooner, uh, earlier in the time of diagnosis, it, it presents. So um, we, we, when we have our patients, so the oligoarthritis patients, the under four joints, they are the most at risk category. And the uveitis is silent, meaning that you don't, that the patient will not complain of anything. You won't see anything from the outside. And that's what the importance of having regular screening examinations. So that can be detected early. One difference would be in the enthesitis related arthritis category is that this can present with a painful red watering eye. Um, so this is, this is unique from uveitis and the other subtypes. Next slide, please. So uveitis uh, is the way we, this is screened for. This can be done 
um, either by an optometrist or an ophthalmologist. And the practice across the country varies very much in terms of who is doing the screening. So the most important examination that your child needs, and the, really the only examination your child needs for screening is the one that's depicted in this picture on the right. So this is the slit lamp exam where the jaw is placed in the cup and they're looking at the space in the front of the eye at an angle. So it's the space between the, the, the cornea and the lens. So where the eye bubbles out, it's the, it's the anterior chamber there. So in clinic for us as rheumatologists, we can't actually see it. We can, we, what we can pick up is if there's complications related to having uveitis for a long time. There's some things we can look for there. But if it's just the inflammatory cells, they really do need to have this examination. So importantly, um, about three quarters of it presents within the first two years and just about 92% presents within the first four. So basically the screening is very, very important to adhere to the recommendations, particularly during at least that first four years. Um, and importantly, the uveitis activity of the eye inflammation doesn't go along necessarily with the joints. So you can have quiet joints and active eyes or active. So it's that, so even if the joints are well, the eyes can be needing treatment um, as well uh, instead. So um, there is screening guidelines be familiar with from your rheumatology clinics in terms of the frequency, the risk. Next slide, please. So just to touch a little bit on treatment, um, I believe there'll be a future webinar um, looking more in depth at treatment, but I just wanted to touch a little bit about how we approach um, treatments for our patients with JIA. Next slide, please. So this is two cases we can touch on here. So this is uh, Cindy. Uh, she's a six-year-old uh, girl with a swollen left knee for three months. And um, we, uh, so the doctor says we should start naproxen, which is another, so naproxen is an NSAID, so a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. So what an example of an, an NSAID is naproxen. Um, and then if this is persistent, we would inject the joint with cortisone. Um, and, and the parent responds, oh, but doctor, I've had cortisone shots on my shoulder and it didn't work. So this is one case. We're going to come back to these. So next slide, please. So uh, this is Anna. So she's a three-year-old girl with swollen wrist and fingers. So the physician says we should start methotrexate um, and then we would consider biologics if that's not working. A parent says, oh, but why would I want to put my child on chemotherapy? I've heard methotrexate bad for you. So this, is, um, this would be a, a possible conversation that you'd be having with your uh, physician and would warrant obviously in more in-depth discussion. Next slide, please. So just to touch a little bit about our treatment aims as rheumatologists. Um, so in the short term, we're, we're of course looking to uh, relieve discomfort, preserve function, uh, prevent deformities and control the inflammation. So in the long term, we are looking to find a balance of treatment that allows us to control the disease, but also to have the most minimal amount of side effects to our patients as we can. We of course, always aim for normal growth and development and full participation uh, for all of our patients. That is our goal and we achieve it in the vast majority. Uh, we want to rehabilitate any joints that have lost movement or strength. And we want to support our, ch our, our the child and their family um, in terms of social, uh, emotional and school performance and, uh, as best we can. Next slide, please. So it does take a most optimal care for a patient and their families with juvenile idiopathic arthritis is done by a multidisciplinary team. So that involves um, numerous care providers and this it's optimally done when we all can work together. So that would involve your pediatric rheumatologist, a nurse, physiotherapist, occupational therapist, social worker, um, family doctor or pediatrician, ophthalmologist, at times a psychologist, and of course, liaising with the school uh, and with teachers um, to help support the child uh, in their classroom environment. Uh, next slide. So we, the way we approach uh, treatment is largely based on the number of joints that are affected and some other features. And then I put in bracket here for now, um, because there's a lot of 
really um, groundbreaking and fascinating work going on in the research in juvenile idiopathic arthritis um, in Canada and in collaboration with uh, some of our international partners. And hopefully sometime in the next 10, five to 10 years, we will be able to really tailor uh, treatments for each patient uh, based on looking at markers in their blood and, uh, uh, and other. So for now, uh, and we do, we do very, really quite well looking at doing uh, tailoring treatments to joint, the number of joints, but we can improve always. So we largely treat, treat based on the number of joints. So oligoarticular, polyarticular, uh, systemic is different and uveitis is different. So I'll touch a little bit on each of these. So next slide, please. So patients with oligoarthritis, as we mentioned, is one to four joints. We would use a, a combination of NSAIDs and or local joint injections. Um, and the NSAIDs would involve, could, some of the NSAIDs you might've heard of from your, from your clinics would be naproxen, indomethacin, peroxicam, meloxicam, diclofenac, celecoxib, there's multiple NSAIDs. Um, and if patients are not improving with a combination of either NSAIDs and or joint injections, or they go on to develop many joints, we would treat similar to a polyarticular course. Next slide, please. So polyarticular arthritis, we use NSAIDs, um, but more as a, what we say, symptomatic relief. So to help with pain um, and, and at the beginning, sort of as we're waiting for our other medications to kick in. So it's very unusual that a polyarthritis patient would get by with full treatment response just to NSAIDs. So depending on the number of joints and how much it's impacting the child's life, we might actually put the, put the child on some oral, oral prednisone to take um, as a bridge or and use local injections if there's we can do a couple of joints that are most bothersome but 75 to 80 percent of children with polyarthritis probably more need uh, a second line agent so that we would the most common one you'd use is methotrexate um, and and jen mentioned that so that can be given by uh, a needle at home or by mouth and and that we've been using that for 50 years now in a very safe uh, and effective way. Um, and uh, that is by far the most co common second line agent. Sometimes we use leflunamide, which is also known as Areva. Um, and then, you know, upwards of 20 to 25% of patients with polyarthritis will need biologic agents. Um, and that is the biologic agents we choose uh, in in combination with a discussion with a family uh, and discussing what their preferences are. But some of the common medications that we would use for polyarthritis would be etanercept, adalimumab, tocilizumab. And there are others and the coverage for these medication varies by province um, in, here in Canada. So uh, next slide. So for systemic arthritis, as I mentioned, this is very different from the other subtypes. Again, there's a small number of patients that might get by just with NSAIDs alone. Oftentimes we need to use oral steroids. And then if the arthritis with fevers and rashes and blood inflammation is the main problem on the right-hand side there, you'll see we do use more commonly uh, medications that block certain chemicals in the body. And that's IL-1, so something called anakinra blocks IL-1 or IL-6, something called tocilizumab that blocks that chemical. And, and they seem to work particularly uh, well for this patient group. Uh, and then if arthritis is sort of the problem in, on, in the long term, we can also try some of the other biologics and or methotrexate for this group at times as well. Next slide, please. So uveitis, um, as mentioned, can be uh, a problem on its own, separate from the joints that can be uh, have a very big impact for patients and their, and their parents. Uh, so the first line treatment for uveitis is steroid drops. And depending on how severe the uveitis is, this can be every half an hour, every hour when the child is awake. It can, it's a, can be a very large burden. Um, sometimes, but not too commonly, they can, we might need to give oral prednisone. And then methotrexate works very well for the eyes as well. So that would be the, the medication we would use next to spare the topical, how much topical drops we need and complications related to that. And then certain biologics are better for the eyes. And so that would include infliximab or Remicade and adalimumab, which is Humira. So next slide, please. So I think, as I mentioned, this is an extraordinarily exciting time uh, in, in pediatric rheumatology and a lot of 
uh, amazing work is coming out of uh, a Canadian uh, group of collaborative investigators. Um, and basically, you know, there's already been some work in Canada looking at um, trying to make a prediction score of who's going to need, who's going to have a more severe course. Um, and we're trying to pair this with biology, so blood samples and genetics and markers to try to figure out, you know, which patient needs which medication at what time. That's really our goal. But in, when we're helping to decide which medications to use in arthritis, we think about each patient and what would be most of benefit to this patient, what's the potential harms, and, and, and consider that in the context of, of the family as well. Um, so we want to decrease pain, improve quality of life, prevent joint damage and disability, and then we think about discomforts related to treatment, side effects, and cost, um, in both in terms of time and money to the family, particularly. So coming, you know, drop, commuting to get somewhere to get an IV infusion versus home in, injections, um, depending on where the family lives and access. So these are all considerations for us. Next slide, please. So some work that has come out of come from the uh, particularly from the Vancouver uh, group of rheumatologists has been looking at predicting which patients will have a severe course uh, or a mild course. So if, you, if we think about Cindy who had sort of, you know, one swollen joint responded well to naproxen and joint injections, you know, she has a, a likelihood that this will be a one or two or episodes where we need treatment, but has a good chance of uh, longer term remission. Um, so the pros for doing a combination of naproxen and joint injections would be uh, they are inexpensive, they're easy to access, um, and high chance of remission with joint injections. Um, NSAIDs on the other, on the corollary, can sometimes have stomach upset, very unlikely to have uh, a chance of bleeding from the tummy. That doesn't happen off, it's rare in pediatrics. And then uh, sometimes with steroid injections, you can get um, a bit of uh, tissue or paleness or shrinkage of tissue if the steroid leaks out of the joint. Next slide. So Anna um, had so Anna, as you meant, as we will recall, had many joints involved of the of fingers and hands, and she she was treated with a combination of methotrexate and naproxen. So methotrexate, although um, one the main side effect that we talk about with families is is nausea, and it can it's can be significant, um, but it works very well. So more than seventy five percent of children will have a complete or near complete response to methotrexate. Um, it's inexpensive. We know it well. We know how to monitor for it, and uh, and and we use it in a safe manner. And it and it can prevent joint damage and disability, of course. Um, next slide, please. So I, I, I'm going to end there, and I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the studies. And I've mentioned this uh, as I've gone along, but uh, upcoming and and ongoing studies here in Canada, we have our Canadian Alliance of Pediatric Rheumatology Investigators, or CAPRI JIA registry, which um, I believe nearly all Canadian academic centers are recruiting uh, for this, nearly all. Um, and basically this is a registry where um, at the time of diagnosis, we aim to have our patients with JIA join the registry so we can capture data about joint counts, medications needed, side effects to medications, effect on physical functioning, quality of life, pain. And we're hoping that we can follow the children until they're 18 and beyond if we are able to get, so we can, we can have a better appreciation of how our patients are doing now in the, the way that we treat them in this decade. Um, another one is the You Can Can Do study, which it's understanding childhood arthritis, and it's a collaboration between Canada and the Netherlands. And this is looking particularly at um, looking when we can start and stop biologics and, and trying to help us understand a bit more about uh, particularly that group, but other, uh, other groups of JA as well. And there's so far only two sites in Canada are enrolling for that. That's uh, Calgary and Toronto, but hopefully we'll roll out to the rest of the country shortly. Um, hopefully we'll be starting a study soon looking at trying using a medication called Ondansetron um, upfront with our methotrexate to see if we can have less methotrexate uh, related nausea and have more kids be able to stay on this medication because they have less side effects. So we're going to do a trial to see if that, if that helps. Um, and then there's also some really exciting work looking at 
um, the way that we counsel um, and, and advise our families in a, in a, a more scientific manner called shared decision making and looking at that um, and, and how patients choose their treatments and how engaged patients and families are with their treatment program with their care providers. So hopefully we will be able to start that in the next year or two as well. Uh, next slide. And so that is a, a whirlwind tour. Um, and uh, thank you for your attention. And I'm happy to answer questions. Okay, we're all coming back. Thank you so much, um, Bobby. That was an amazing overview and um, some really good insight into sort of the future of GIA, what the treatments look like, what the outcomes are and what people are, are working on um, towards getting kids to a pain-free future. And we have some questions coming in. We actually have questions coming in on a few different channels. Um, so again, use that Q&A box down at uh, the bottom of your Zoom screen to enter in your questions and we'll get through as many as we can. Um, you can also ask questions. Jen O'Shea will be joining us uh, as well. So we're gonna have Bobby, Jen, and myself, and we'll get through as many questions as we can. And again, if we don't get to every question, we will do our best um, to answer them afterwards in a follow-up. So thank you again so much to our presenters, and we will get started on our questions. Um, so the first question that uh, actually came through was for Jen, and I just wanna make sure Jen is with us here because I don't see her little video box there. I see her coming now. <laughs> Hi, Jen. So the first question we had, first of all, we had um, quite a few people just coming in and saying, thank you so much, um, Dr. Berard, for all you do for your patients. So we had a few comments of that. And Jen, we got um, quite a few comments just sharing hugs to you and Lily and really just relating to your story. Um, and that, you know, that's one of the really special part of Cassie and Friends is just parents being able to talk to other parents, youth being able to talk to other youth. One of the questions, Young when she was diagnosed, but what does she understand about her condition now and, and how does she deal with some of the challenges that might bring? Um, I guess it's, it's tricky for her because, I mean, she's never really known any difference. It's hard when she was first diagnosed, she was two, so she couldn't really verbalize to us how she felt. So, I mean, now she knows she has arthritis and i think really what she associates arthritis with is sore feet really i think anything else she never complains about it i mean the only thing i think she'd remember complaining about is her feet and obviously getting a needle in the back side of her leg every wednesday mm -hmm. is kind of what arthritis is to her so yeah and does she does she share with her classmates or teachers at school? Is that something? Um, no, I don't. I mean, her close friends, I guess, would know. Like the walk for arthritis that we've been to every year since we were diagnosed. We lots of her friends came to it, so close friends would know. But because it hasn't defined her really, I mean, it hasn't slowed her down any. I don't think if the teacher didn't know they wouldn't know i mean i always they know because of her student records but in terms of not being able to do anything no it's yeah great great um so bobby the next question is for you so we're getting a, quite a few questions actually about just understanding the difference between pain and a flare and so especially um pain in the absence of visible inflammation in the doctor's appointment. I wonder if you could just expand on that a little bit. Oh, it's a great question. Um, and I, I will try to articulate an answer. I don't think, I don't think I have a magic answer for this. So I know that I don't. So, um, so I think, so patients with JIA have pain uh, separate, separated from our ability to detect swelling with our hands, swelling with an MRI machine, swelling with an ultrasound machine, and findings on physical examination. So 
we base our assessment of patients um, largely on what we can feel and what we're hearing. So if we, if our patient is largely having pain after, you know, they're doing a lot of physical activity, uh, you know, if there's, you know, some muscle imbalances that we can detect on physical examination, if there's, some patients have really loose or flexible joints that when you're doing physical activity, those, um, they sort of overstretch things that someone who's not as flexible wouldn't do. And so sometimes even our patients that have JIA, you know, they have pain from other reasons than their JIA. So sometimes we think it is because of muscle imbalances. Sometimes it's because the joints are flexible and they're being overextended and over, over stretched. Um, sometimes it's, you know, it's alignment. We, we look for other um, causes of pain that we can help to rehabilitate with physiotherapy, muscle strengthening, um, and, and sometimes it's because of non-arthritis related problems. And sometimes it is related to the arthritis. We just can't put our finger on it. We can't, we can't say with our eyes or our hands that, that it is you know, arthritis, but it very well probably is. And so when there is pain in the absence of us seeing arthritis, we, we try to help um, suggest techniques so that the child can live a pain-free life. What, so that would be a combination of adding in an NSAID, doing physiotherapy, working on strengthening, particularly around the affected joint, um, and, and just trying to, to advise and support so that the child can carry on. Um, and if it is an arthritis-related pain, you know, and sometimes it declares itself, sometimes it takes a bit of time, but then you actually see that swelling or the loss of range. And so then that helps us, you know, say, okay, maybe we need a stronger, bigger treatment. We're not, we are reticent to add in some a potentially medication with side effects more so than something like an NSAID in the absence of us being able to visually um, see something or feel something. So I don't know that that answers the question, but it, there is pain separate from arthritis, 100%. And sometimes it's arthritis related and sometimes it is not. And we have to find ways to uh, facilitate optimal functioning for the patient. That's what, we, that's what our goal is. <laughs> yeah. I think one thing so important in that is just keeping a really good dialogue. And you talked about how important the partnership was with the families, the patients, and the parents, and their pediatric rheumatology team. So just ensuring that when there is pain present, um, you investigate that and you speak with your team about it. Absolutely. So going sort of back to the beginning of, of um, a child's journey with rheumatic disease. So, um, and this sort of picks up on Jen's story where Lily was brought into uh, the pediatric rheumatology specialty from orthopedics. But it seems like um, the question is that a lot of rheumatology cases are brought in late in the diagnosis journey or, or after uh, you know, being seen by other subspecialties. Is, is this because of the rarity of juvenile arthritis or is there another reason that this happens? Um, I think there's multiple factors to it. Um, I think that, so JIA, you know, one to three per, you know, thousand children, it's not rare per se. I think historically there's been a lack of awareness. Um, and I think we are working on that as pediatric rheumatologists and obviously in you guys as, as Cassie and friends, you're right we're trying to spread the word, right? That's our, we, we want people to know that kids get arthritis too. This is, you know, to, so that people that kids can get picked up quicker. Um, so I think it, it it has to do with uh, lack of awareness. Um, I think sometimes it has to do with unfortunately access. So where you where you live, you know, in relation to where we are, um, you know, there's also referral patterns and referral biases. So you know, there wasn't a pediatric rheumatologist here on staff full time until you know. 2009, but essentially 2011, I, I started full time. Um, so the any swollen joint went to ortho, and ortho, you know. So there's these patterns that develop, and then it takes a lot longer to get into ortho, generally speaking, than it does to room. But it has to be kind of cut off at that level where it's coming to us rather to ortho. So I think it's it is it's awareness. Um, it's that you know 
because our patients don't complain so much, it, 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 there's a delay sometimes, unless it's a very painful arthritis, which does happen as well. But it, there can be a delay because uh, they're subtle findings. Um, yeah, so I, I think there's multiple factors to that. But I think with all of the important work that we're doing to raise awareness of JIA, um, I hope that we're doing a better job in terms of delay. And that is something that our Capri registry is looking at as well in terms of delay to getting to us. And hopefully we're, we're improving on that. So, yeah. And lucky for kids, if I've learned anything in Cassie and Friends is that parents know their kids and they're persistent and are amazing advocates in knowing that they, they need more support and help than and answers than potentially they're getting. Um, sort of one sort of um, question going back to your presentation about treatments, um, a, a potentially simple question, but not a simple question at all. But so it was just, what does biologic mean? Yeah, that's a great question too. So biologics, uh, the way I describe it is that they're medications that target uh, chemicals that we have in our own body. So um, they mimic or they mimic, a, they mimic something that we have. So they often block something we have too much of. So by over the years in studying, you know, the, the arthritis tissue or blood of patients with arthritis, we've learned that there's some chemicals that are too high uh, in the body that are causing the inflammation and the swelling and the pain. Um, and one of them is something called TNF or tumor necrosis factor. So some of the, bio, the biologics that we use target to block that chemical. So they're, they, they look, we have our own blockers in our body, but we are, these are like super high numbers of blockers that we're, we're adding on to actually go block that chemical that's way too high, that's important in causing our, this not causing, is the, is important, is way too high in our inflammatory joints. So it, um, when we have arthritis, we have an imbalance of these chemicals that should be balanced if our immune system was working the way it should. So when you have juvenile arthritis, what, some of these chemicals are high and they're causing these problems. And we have these natural blockers, but we're adding in these biologic agents to block them more powerfully because they're way too high, if that makes sense. So they, they mimic chemicals we have in our own body. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Great answer. Oh. Simple, but not simple. <laughs> um, and in terms of just going a little bit more to the subtypes that you described. So we have a question about what you, whether you can elaborate just a little bit more on the undifferentiated subtype and how that specific subtype is treated. Yeah, so that, that's a great question. Um, I think all of our hopes in pediatric rheumatology is with revamping our classification with biology and genetics, et cetera, we're going to be able to abandon that category because it's confusing to, to us and to patients. So the way that we, I didn't touch on it, probably on purpose, um, <laughs> the way we sort of lump patients is we have a series of exclusions. Like if you have a family member with psoriasis or if you have those fevers or if you have the rheumatoid factor positive, it helps us to kind of partition patients. And undifferentiated is when you either don't meet all the criteria to get into a category, or actually, in fact, you have enough criteria to fit into two. So we end up calling those patients undifferentiated. And if in some, you know, clinic space, clinic, if you look at clinic um, characteristics, it can represent up to 20%. So, you know, I think we do our best with our classification, but there is, you know, 10 to 20% of kids that are not fitting in but we treat them how we treat all of the other patients. And so it, it, it does a di disservice that we're not able to kind of put them into these other categories. We call them undifferentiated, but we still treat patients with undifferentiated arthritis based on what their findings are. So the number of joints, if they have enthesitis, we target, we target what the patient is suffering with, basically. Right. Mm -hmm. right. And so speaking about fitting into two categories or et cetera, um, we actually have a very specific question about whether someone can have um, both JIA and psoriatic arthritis. And this is someone who, who was diagnosed at a very young age with juvenile idiopathic arthritis and is now um, a teenager and has psoriatic arthritis. And so just, just understanding how they can, can they transgress into other forms of arthritis? Can you have two types at once? Yeah. So that's, that's a great question as well. So, um, so 
patients, so um, adult patients with psoriatic arthritis have psoriasis for many years, can be decades, and they may or may not get arthritis. Okay, so that's adult patients. Where pediatric patients are different. So when I was talking, so when I was talking about psoriatic arthritis subtype, I, I actually didn't even show you a picture of psoriasis because a vast majority of our patients that are in this psoriatic arthritis subtype don't actually have psoriasis. They have this first degree relative of psoriasis, they have nail changes and they have dactylitis. So patients with psoriatic JIA subtype can be labeled as having had oligoarthritis or polyarthritis for many, many, you know, well, they might have a first degree relative, but you can have oligoarthritis or polyarthritis that then yes, you go on and develop psoriasis later on. So, so, but we would have treated you the same way when you were younger, oligo or poly, but if you went on to get psoriasis or you as a teen or an, or a young adult, you started to have much more features of sort of nail changes, psoriasis, or you were getting dactylitis. I think it's just, it's a different, uh, presentation of the same condition. It's not that it's I, that you switched. Mm -hmm. So some, you know, some patients with polyarthritis develop psoriasis five or 10 or 15 years later. And then yes, we do call you psoriatic. We do. Right. That's not that confusing. <laughs> oh. That sounds anyway, like it's yeah. confusing. <laughs> that know. Is. So, that I, is. so I think it's not two separate problems. It's just the expression of the disease can change. Right. And particularly with psor psoriatic subtype of arthritis, you don't have to have psoriasis to get that label. Mm -hmm. So you can't if you develop psoriasis later. We then call you psoriatic JIA. It's true. It's true. Mm -hmm. So yeah. this, this question, it follows up a little bit on, on um, the role of the rheumatologist as problem solver and investigator and sleuth a little bit. And it's for, I guess, both Jen and Bobby in a sense. So Jen, out of, of interest, someone is asking about um, family history. So is there a history of arthritis or rheumatic disease in your family? And then um, after Jen answers, Bobby, maybe you can give us some of the science and research about whether there is any um, evidence that, that this can be passed on. Yeah, I mean, we were asked that the day that Lily was diagnosed and no, I mean, in my 80-year-old grandmother, yes, but early earlier on no definitely not now my husband they asked too if either of us had psoriasis and he lifted up his pant leg to show his knee and the i think it was one of dr bart's interns at the time he's like yeah i think that's psoriasis but never anything that's been formally diagnosed and anything that's bothered him to a degree right so no we didn't have anything that ran in our family so Um, so they, so, uh, it's a great question. So I always say that it's what, like one in a hundred chance that you'd have a sibling with JIA. That's the number I remember in my mind. And so in my practice over time, I've had three sibling pairs or four sibling pairs. Um, you know, so it's, so rheumatoid arthritis is one in a hundred people and JIA is one in a thousand. So you say, so the likelihood of having a parent with RA is not insignificant, but we don't think of JIA is not passed down in families, for example. Um, and if the way we kind of look at that as well is if you have identical twins um, where they share the same uh, genetics and DNA, it's only between a third and a half of time will you actually even have both twins affected. So it's clearly more than just our genes that are putting us at risk of getting, excuse me, arthritis. And it's there's not one single gene that gives us arthritis. It's a collection of gene changes probably, and then some environmental, we call environmental triggers. So um, it, 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 for the most part, I would say there is, it's not inherited through families, but autoimmunity is so very common. So to get a, a family member with RA or lupus, or it's very, that is common, right? But, right? but it's uncommon to have a sibling with, with JIA. That's not common. So, so Switching track a little from diagnosis of rheumatic disease to treatment, um, we have a couple questions. Uh, we actually have 
a ton of questions coming in, which is amazing. We have about 60 people viewing right now, which is awesome that all these people are, are getting this information. So thank you again for sticking with us for the Q&A. Um, we have a couple questions about the role that nutrition plays in juvenile arthritis. Um, if there are any food categories that increase inflammation and generally how nutrition can, oh, you know, what, if any evidence is there around nutrition um, being able to either control inflammation or playing a role in, in um, pain or flares? So Jen, I think that's actually a, a really great um, question as well. And it's something that you may wish to have a dietitian do a webinar as part of this education series, because there's some really uh, great speakers um, and dietitians in, in the JIA world. Um, my short and long answer of that would be uh, a healthy, balanced uh, diet is what we would recommend on the whole. Um, you know, there's always going to be anecdotally, um, you know, patients that find that they are better on a dairy free or gluten free diet. That is a common thing that we hear. Um, certainly, you know, when I'm counseling families, I say, if you want to try an elimination diet, only do one thing at a time and try it for six weeks. If you're no better then reintroduce it because having JIA alone puts so many restrictions on your life and, and challenges that I, I just don't feel, because we don't have evidence scientifically to suggest, you know, there should be a certain diet followed that's going to significantly change your arthritis course. But anecdotally, some, you know, people will have their own opinions and, and it's how you feel that, that matters. Right. So I was, you know, I would count, you know, I would just suggest those are the two most common culprits that people ask about is dairy and gluten, and then you can try. Uh, but then I would go back to, to life to, you know, if it go back to how things were, if it didn't work. Um, I would also add that very, very, very popular in medicine. And uh, right now is the microbiome, which is the, all of the bacteria, healthy bacteria that live in our, healthy and harmful bacteria that live in our guts. And I think this is an exploding field in all aspects of medicine because we do not understand how that well, how that relates to our health and disease. And um, that is very, very interesting and fascinating that I think we'll learn much more in the next coming decades. But, you know, I, if you ask me again in 20 years, I may have a very different answer, but right now there's not a particular diet that we as a rheumatology community would be advising or not advising to our patients. Right, right. And I, we, uh, we've had an amazing um, nutritionist speaker at one of our Cassie and Friends family days in the past. So we do hope to um, add that to our virtual education series coming up because we know families have so many questions around it. And what, but I do remember, of, of course, that you know one of the big takeaways from that session was, again, if, if you have questions, do it in consultation with your core pediatric rheumatology team and, and ensure there's an open dialogue. Like, don't be afraid to ask. Don't try things in private, but do it as a, a partnership and, and really understand that everyone's doing the best and, and wanting the best for, for the child at hand, but, but doing it together in a, in a sort of research-based and evidence-based way so that, that the child is getting the best care possible. Um, also on the treatment side, we had a little question about um, methotrexate and how on Densitron um, can support a child um, affected by uh, some of the side effects of methotrexate. Yes, yeah, so on Dancitron, so uh, on Dancitron is an anti-nauseant. Uh, so Gravol is one that you can buy over the counter that you would have heard about, um, everyone I'm sure. Um, and then on Dancitron uh, is non-drowsy and it works more centrally uh, in the brain and is used very, very commonly in the cancer world. Um, and they use a lot of nausea inducing medications. Um, so the, the way that methotre so methotrexate induces nausea in probably 70 to 80 or maybe 100% of children if, you, if they manage to stay on it long enough. Um, and it, it, it's, a, it's a deep rooted sort of Pavlovian dog response. So it's, it's not within the child's control. It does make them feel sick. And then there's a pattern of association that develops. Um, and that, you know, seeing the color yellow will make them sick. They think it's the alcohol swabs, but it's not, but it's, it's, it's all the series and steps of events. And there's been some very, um, neat work by one of the nurses in Montreal children's looking at sort of what a, how a child perceives, um, the day of their methotrexate and what they experience in their minds, even like preparing themselves to walk down the stairs. It's actually 
it's actually so interesting. So methotrexate certainly makes our kids nauseous. Um, Ondansetron is an anti-nauseant and we're hoping perhaps, well, that's the wish and we're trying to find ways that we can uh, break that cycle, that, that automated response before it gets to the point where kids have to stop the methotrexate. Because at some point, you know, parents do their best and kids do their best always, but sometimes the, the, the nausea is so significant that it's just, it's unbearable. So we're, we're hoping, and we don't know this, but we're hoping perhaps if we introduce the Ondansetron upfront, even before the nausea cycle develops, that maybe we'll be able to have more of our patients stay on their methotrexate longer because they can tolerate it better. Um, because if not for nausea, methotrexate, you know, any of the other side effects are minimal to none. We do the blood work monitoring, you know, we, it, it's very safe and, and overall very well tolerated in our pediatric patients. It's really the nausea, but it's, it's, it's a big deal. So we need to figure out ways. And in, in Germany, for example, they have obviously very crazy, very well-funded pediatric rheumatology clinics, but they've done studies and they have, they've worked in using hypnosis for methotrexate induced nausea and it works like, but who has access to free hypnosis for your patients? I mean, so it, it, there is other workarounds, but they're all not without, they're all time consuming, costly, et cetera. So we're hoping perhaps on Densitron may, may, this may be a, we, we hope it's going to work basically. Yes. <laughs> Jen, we actually had a, a question for you and sort of this, the same vein, but just about um, what challenges you've faced or experienced with Lily in uh, the treatments that she's been prescribed and how you might have overcome them or, or dealt with them together. Um, I think that's maybe one of the luckiest pieces with our journey thus far is that um, she hasn't reacted negatively to the methotrexate at all, really. I mean, who am I to say? I guess maybe she has and she's just never complained about it, but she's never once said it's made her feel sick. Um, oftentimes she gets it in the morning before she goes to school and she just gets it and away she goes. So I have no idea if that's because she was two when we first started and we never ever made a big deal about it for us. It was just, this is it. I mean, you don't have a choice about this and it was quick and easy and it's still, I mean, now that she's bigger, she can sometimes make a fuss about it, but she knows that she has to get it and it is what it is. So, I mean, she did take naproxen, I guess, too, earlier on and it was disgusting, but she just, took it like a champ and chug juice after or whatever it was. But I must say with the methotrexate, we've been really lucky so far. Is there, is there more nausea, uh, um, Bobby, with um, the oral versus the injectable methotrexate or, or does it, is it, does it make any difference? Yeah. I mean, that's a great question. So we, we say that in theoretically the needles, because you're bypassing the stomach, that the needles would have less nausea associated with it. But you know, as we push the dose up, patients also get nauseous with needles. Um, so I think it's very individualized for the patient. Um, and some of our teenagers, they're, they, they're, they obviously just advocate for themselves and they choose which route if we can, right? So we, we, you know, after a certain dose of methotrexate, absorption is better by needles. And so we, depending on how severe the disease is, we will counsel families that we would prefer to put you onto sub-Q and also in preparation for accessing biologics. You, you, most provinces, you need to have been on sub-Q anyway. Um, but certainly, you know, we, we believe that there's less side effects with sub-Q, but having said that, you can still have nausea with the sub-Q. Yeah. Amazing. Well, as I mentioned, we have uh, so many great questions coming in. I just want to say we are at um, 5.45, which was sort of our cutoff time that we had originally planned. Do, do, do you have time for a couple more questions, Bobby? Uh, yeah, and then for anyone um, in terms of uh, questions that we haven't got to, um, we will uh, follow up after um, either on the Cassie and Friends, you can watch our social media or blog, and we'll try and answer some of these questions. Um, for those who are asking specifically about uveitis, uh, I just wanted to mention that we actually have a, a specific uveitis session happening next month 
on October 24th um, from Dr. Alan Rosenberg, who is actually leading an international team right now um, with some very cutting edge research around uveitis. So if your question is about uveitis, I highly recommend to actually anyone attending that session, um, given that screening is so important, but um, know that you will um, get your answers question or your questions answered there as well. Um, so, I mean, I, I think every parent asks this question question and and I there is no crystal ball um, but to your best of your ability um, Bobby uh, will kids ever be free of arthritis what are the chances they'll grow out of it um, and maybe you can even give a little bit insight into you know medicated remission versus the chance of unmedicated remission so um... I mean, we strive for medicated and unmedicated remission in every patient that we're treating. And we, yeah, so that's the first answer. That's our goal. Medic well, we just want our kids to be living full active lives to their potential. So that is our first goal, of course. Um, depending on subtype, there's higher chances of getting in into full remission. Um, you know, if, even if you think about oligoarthritis, so under four joints, you know, if you, if you, studies are older now, so this is the importance of our registry now, but if you look at those patients into their 30s, half of them, even though they had may have been in remission for 10 or 15 years, half of them will have had to have dealt with their arthritis as an adult. Not that they've had arthritis for 35 years straight, but they've had, they've had to deal with it again. So, you know, I think even if we think about oligoarthritis, which we can think milder, but it, it isn't always, um, you know, a good percentage of those 60, 70% go into long-term sustained medication-free remission. But, you know, we follow kids only till they're 18. And then, you know, we, we don't know, but we do know that, you know, half of them will still have to have dealt with it as an adult. So that's why we don't speak of cure at this point in our in our practices we don't speak of cure we we, we aim for disease free remission and it's you know what is what is clearer probably to all of us now is if we treat more aggressively up front we we do change the disease course for the patient so you know this the way that we treat now in 2020 it's been we've been like this the last at least 10 to 15 years probably um where you know we we quickly move from methotrexate to a biologic, you know, because we we we've we have data to support this, but also we just know that if we get in there early, we can often change the trajectory of what was going to happen. So, you know, polyarthritis patients, you know, we are very good at getting those patients under control as well. So, you know, by by two years, you know, more than 70% of those kids are in full remission. But we just, we know if we try to withdraw the medications, there's also similarly like 70 or 80% chance that it's going to come back. So I think the hardest part for families and for us as care providers is truly the roller coaster that is JIA. So it's always, you know, parents are very scared to start medications for their kids. And I can appreciate that. But it's also once you finally, everybody is moving on and living their life, it's hard and scary to take medications away because you don't want to live through what you did, you already did. So it's it's such a balance. Um, but certainly, you know, patients with spine arthritis as part of enthesitis related arthritis, we don't really try to take those medications away. They transfer to adults with them ongoing. Um, polyarthritis patients have a you know more than fifty percent chance of it coming back. Oligos can have a, you know seventy five percent chance of long term remission, but may have to deal with something as an adult. It's very variable. Systemic arthritis, you know, has always been a very, you know, different and, and can be life-threatening and very severe disease, but the medications we have now have really changed the face of that disease. And so now using those biologics, we, we have more, you know, kids can be cured from that disease, truthfully, um, so in some cases. It, it, but yeah, so I hope one day we will you know, the, the mantra is find the cause, find the cure. Um, 
And so that, that ties into all the work that's being done with biology and genetics. And, and, and I, I'm, I'm hopeful. I know that our community is very hopeful. Uh, we've made so much progress in the last 20 years, and I can't imagine all of what's going to come in the next 20, right? So, um, yeah, we're, we're very hopeful, but, but unfortunately, we never speak at this point of, of cure. Yeah. Well, I have to say that um, it's probably a, a great place to start closing. And um, Cassie and Friends is an organization we're hopeful to. And and if you are, you know, newly diagnosed, or um, we had some great questions that we didn't have time to get to about transition, but um, I'll, I'll be talking a little bit about some excellent resources we have uh, for teens in just a second. And we do have a, a transition session. Um, being planned for our virtual education as well, but but Cassie and Friends is a place to come and and find hope with others, um, and keep working towards that goal of a pain-free future for kids because we we do feel that we can get there um, by all working together. Um, Jen, I might just ask one last question as as I come to a conclusion, but whether um, disguised or undisguised, um, have have there been any gifts from your journey with juvenile arthritis that, that maybe were unexpected along the way for, for yourself, for Lily, for your family? Um, I mean, just, I think we're so blessed that we are so close to a fabulous medical facility um, in London. As talked about before, like I couldn't even imagine having to deal with traveling for hours to for appointments. I think that is a big gift. I mean, as crazy as it sounds to be so lucky that we're right here where the professionals are, Dr. Brad and her team. I mean, it's been a lifesaver for sure. Thank you, Jen. And thank you so much to, to Bobby and Jen for, for joining us here today. Um, and just touching on, on what you said, Jen, like we work with so many amazing kids and, and now teens and young adults through Cassie and Friends as part of our youth leader network. And I, it's amazing to hear, you know, their stories of, of what stands out for them in their journey. And it was those special times, like, you know, the appointments can be overwhelming in a schedule, but those special times with mom or dad or, or their siblings, you know, before and after appointments. And, and also just, um, I think, you know, through the young adults and we've had our, our virtual youth panel, which you can find on our website. These are just amazing, amazing young adults with so much insight and empathy and, and, and um, self-awareness that, um, you know, we feel so fortunate to work in this community and, and, and do see some of the gifts that, that this journey can bring. Um, so with that, I think um, we're gonna bring back on a few last slides just to close the presentation. So I just wanted to give one huge, huge thank you again to both of our speakers, um, Dr. Bobby Berard and um, Jen O'Shea and your, your daughter, Lily, for letting us show all those beautiful pictures of her, but also our presenting series sponsors uh, who make this series possible and will be helping us to bring um, a series of educational sessions um, throughout the year. So that's Nicola Wealth Management, Abvi, Amgen, Roche, and Sobe. Um, and I just also wanted to, if we go to the next slide, um, just give a sense of what's coming up next. So really, really important right after this, um, in your email, you're going to find a link to uh, an event, a, a survey. So we'd love to just get your feedback, love to know what you thought of this event, what other series or topics you'd like us to cover, um, and any other feedback you'd like to provide. So please do um, fill out that survey so that we can continue to serve um, parents and patients just at, to the best of our ability. We also have some really exciting events coming up. Um, we've been connecting teens online. Um, this is a teen game night coming up. It's part of our teen arthritis and auto-inflammatory group on Friday, October 2nd. And you can find all that information on our website under our events section. Our next um, special speaker series, again, I mentioned it's Dr. Alan Rosenberg will be presenting on UV-itis. That's Saturday, October 24th at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, or PST and 7.30 p.m. Eastern. And then uh, in December, we will have actually a registered psychologist from BC Children's Hospital, Dr. Penny Sneddon. We'll be talking about anxiety and depression in children with rheumatic disease. So 
um, covering everything from needle phobia to um, all the range of emotions that a child can experience in living with either chronic pain or rheumatic disease. And um, we're really excited to be bringing that. It's a, be a great time at the end of the year to get some tools under our belt to, to really tackle that and, and, and just live our healthiest, best lives in the new year. Next slide. Um, so finally, um, please, if you're watching this and haven't connected with Cassie and Friends before, we really encourage you to keep in touch. Um, what I want to point out on this slide is our online support network. Um, so if you visit CassieandFriends.ca um, forward slash support network, you will be connected uh, straight to other families online in our community, live community, um, where you can either just share experiences, ask questions. Um, we call this our expert virtual education series. And, you know, some of the biggest experts in, experts in our community are the parents and, and patients themselves, the youth who are living with juvenile arthritis and other rheumatic diseases. So please do take that opportunity to connect with others, especially in this time of social isolation. And with that, I just want to thank everyone again for attending tonight and being a part of the Cassie and Friends community. We appreciate you being here and look forward to bringing you more uh, education, support, and connection uh, in the year to come. So thank you very much and goodbye.